Dodge City and in the territory out west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wagons filled with kids. Yeah. Well, how'd you know Lank could bring the kids along? <laughs> well, he always does. Oh. But, uh, John hey, look, there's the pilcher, boys. Hardin. And way down there is Emma Gold. <laughs> is Ain't seen her in town for a spell either. Not in the area. Respectfully, Matt Dillon. U.S. Marshal. Does it? <sighs> Chester. Yes, sir? Will you shut the door? You're letting in all the flies in Kansas. But, Mr. Dillon, I can't... Shut the door, out. Chester. You can go out or stay in, but shut the door. Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Dillon, this town's just busting with people. All here for the races tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. You going out to the flats tomorrow? I don't know, Chester. Well, you don't sound like you hanker after going too much. Well, I don't. I wish Colonel Benson's officers would forget about horse racing. <laughs> well, I guess they figure their army graves are about the best horses in the country. Well, everybody knows the cavalry has good horses. They don't have to prove it every four or five months. Well, Mr. Dillon, I just plain don't understand. Ain't nobody likes a horse race better than you. <sighs> I know, Chester. I like them fine, but that's not... Marshal Dillon? Yeah, that's right. Lieutenant Flagg, sir, Fort Dodge. Oh, well, sit down, Lieutenant. Colonel Benson's compliments, sir. And he requests your presence at the fort tomorrow. For the races. That's right, sir. The colonel feels that a peace officer out there would be, uh, well, a steadying influence. I see. And uh, I take it you don't. No, Marshal, I don't. We can police our own activities. I see. After all, we're certainly competent to handle a bunch of sod busters. Well, the last time there were races out at the fort, three men were shot. Is that how you would handle things, Lieutenant? I wasn't stationed at Fort Dodge then, Marshal. But I know this. If people around here want to bet their stock against Army Mouse, they shouldn't complain if they lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long have you been out here, Lieutenant? I was stationed in Virginia until two months ago. Yeah, I thought so. What do you mean? Look, Lieutenant, out here, when men have something to complain about, they sometimes do it with a six-gun. They don't all have the respect for the army that you have. They would if I had the say of it. Oh, maybe, but uh, you don't. It's like with the Indians. A lot of the junior officers feel as I do. We'd go after them, force them into the open. And bring on another Indian war? And we'd beat them. But it would cost more than you'd believe, Lieutenant. <laughs> Not if the three I saw leaving Dodge a while back were any example. An old man on a shaggy gray pony and two young boys. That was a Kiowa, Lieutenant. He's a chief, and those two braves are his sons. His name's Howling Dog. You seem to know a good deal about Indians, Marshal. <clears throat> Lieutenant Flagg, you're a young officer. You're ambitious and you're eager, but uh, you talk too much 
And you don't even know part of what you're talking about. Now, look here. Tell Colonel Benson I'll be out there tomorrow. Very good, Marshal. And Lieutenant. Yes? I've known Holland Dog ever since I came to Kansas. He's old, but he isn't stupid. So, uh, don't guess wrong about him. His pa sure must have hated the world, Mr. Dillon. Ah, oh, he's young, Chester. He'll learn. Yes, sir. But you know, sometimes fellas grow up and don't improve a bit. Oh, there you are. Well, hello, Matt. And Chester. How are you, Doc? I, uh, passed a young lieutenant on the way out. Is, uh, Chester enlisting in the Army, Matt? Oh, Chester oh, in the Army. Oh, my <laughs> gracious, Doc. What's on your mind, Doc? Oh, well, just thought you'd know. I won't be around town tomorrow. I'm taking the day off. Oh, is that so? Yep, I'm going out to the Ford for the races. Might even work up some business. Thought you was taking the day off. <laughs> Chester. Uh, <clears throat> say, Matt, that fella Hunter out there, regimental surgeon, you know? Yeah. Well, he thinks he's the only good doctor around these parts. Well, ain't he? He... Uh... Oh, well. Uh... Now, Matt, if you were going to be out there, you might push a little practice my way. The last time, a hunter got six cases out of seven. The only man he let me have was dead. Well, look, Doc, I'll tell you, if Lieutenant Flagg was running things, maybe we could arrange a whole massacre for you. Well, who's Lieutenant Flagg? The lieutenant you seen him leaving. Yeah, Colonel Benson sent him in, Doc. <laughs> Seems I've got an official invitation just to make sure the civilian element don't get to shooting each other. Oh, now, Matt, you don't think they'd do that again, do you? No, Doc. If there's any trouble out there this time, it won't be the townspeople that started. It'll be Lieutenant Flagg and his crowd. Oh, that's so? Well, how's that, Matt? Well, he's got no use for anything but army. And he just as soon shoot an Indian as see one. Well? Howland Dog's in this part of the country again, Doc. Oh? And I wouldn't be too surprised but what he shows up at the races tomorrow. You'd think this was the first horse race ever run, Matt. Yeah. Seems like the betting's running high. Just talking to the Pilcher boys. They're betting everything they own on a Missouri mare they brought out here. Well, I've seen her, Chester. She's a good mare. Oh, I've never heard so much horse talk in my life as I have tonight. Pasterns, stifles, gaskins, four quarters, hind quarters, short couples, long barrels. <laughs> well, I tell you, Matt, it kind of makes a girl wonder. Well, don't you worry, Kitty. There'll be other nights. Well, there better be. And Matt... Look there, coming in the door. What? No, oh, it's that Lieutenant Flagg and some other officers. Yeah, they're down here to fan the fire, I guess. What do you mean? Now, the more they get this crowd worked up, the higher the betting will be. Oh, jinkies, I wish I had some money to bet. I'll just be glad you haven't, Chester. Good evening, Marshal. Lieutenant Flagg, uh, Miss Russell. How do you do? Miss Russell, Lieutenants Dryden, Lawson, Mao. How, How do you do? do? Uh, well, gentlemen, is anyone drinking? I think we all are. Bartender, set out some glasses. You'll join us, won't you, Miss Russell? Oh, why, thank you, Lieutenant. You too, Marshal? Well, I... I uh... think I'll just walk down to the other end of the bar, Mr. Dillon. It's crowded here. Hey, you, uh, fellas from Fort Dodge, ain't you? That's right. You own some of them army greys that are going to run tomorrow? We do. Hey, well, my name's Pilcher, Cy Pilcher. I got some money to bet on my mare. I'll match her any way you say. Well, I'll take your bet, Mr. Pilcher. Name it. Uh, gentlemen. Five hundred dollars getting... silver. Run three, four, five hundred yards. That's a lot of money. You mean you ain't got it? I'll go with you, Flag. All right, it's a bet then. Good. I'll see you tomorrow then. Out to the fort. Well, <laughs> gentlemen. Easy as taking a... a pig. That fellow <laughs> wouldn't know a horse from a Missouri mule. Maybe that's what he's got. From his looks, he could be running himself. <laughs> you dirty pig. All right, man. hold it, Pilcher. There ain't no man can name me like that. Hold it, I said. You, wearing a uniform, calling yourself a soldier. I was fought outside of Atlanta while you were still nursing. Listen, you... All right. Now, that's enough. Now, Pilcher, you get down to the other end of the bar. And as for you, gentlemen, you better start back for the fort. Now, look, Marshal, we don't have to take Move. It. All of you. Come on, Flag. Let's go. Well, at least 
course, they paid for the bottle before you ran them off. <laughs> you want a drink? No, Kitty, not for me, thank you. You, you go ahead. Uh, look, Matt, you can't stop trouble every time before it starts. No, I can't, Kitty. But I wish tomorrow was done with. <laughs> Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, three burglars lucky at theft prove unlucky at gambling. To make matters worse, authorities catch up with them on their theft rap as well in the case of the cold dice on Gangbusters later tonight. Hear how Lady Luck refused to smile at a gang of free and easy crooks and how Justice and the cops closed in on their escapades. Hear Gangbusters presented by CBS Radio later tonight on most of these stations. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Well, afternoon's most gone, Mr. Dillon. There hasn't been any trouble yet. The whiskey isn't gone, though, and there's still a race to come. Flag's been holding it off. Yes, sir. Well, at least here on the finish line, we can see which way the money's going. Matt! Oh, Matt! Oh, hello, Doc. Well, we haven't seen you all afternoon, Doctor. Where you been? Oh, well, just playing pinochle with some of the boys. Things have been dull, but uh, they won't be in a minute. No, why? Flag and Pilcher are down there at the start now. You see them? The big race is due any minute. Yeah. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? You keep your eyes open. And as soon as they cross the finish line, you get to Pilcher and I'll pick up Flag. All right, sir. Yeah, let's see. Any minute now. Any minute they'll be out. Uh, here oh. they come. Get moving, Chester. I'll find Flag. Yes, sir. All right. Pardon me, will you? Will you? Excuse me, please. Yeah. Will you pardon me, please? Excuse Walk that horse, good, Sergeant. Hello, Lieutenant. You got a fast horse there. Fastest on the post. Yeah. And the Pilcher boys lost about everything they had just now. You preaching at me, Marshal? No, Lieutenant, I've seen horse races before. Yeah, and he won easy, Marshal. I guess he did, Lieutenant Mal. And he could have won from any other horse just as easy. Maybe. Well, Flag, you beat my mare. Thought maybe I might have won, but you got a good horse. Real good horse. You getting ready to talk me out of my money? You're not much of a man, but you got a good mount, and I'm paying you here. $500 silver. Come on, Tom. Let's go home. Well, Marshal, the races are over. The Army won and no trouble. You sorry? I got no complaints, Lieutenant Flagg. Looks like the Colonel was worried about nothing. Thinking there might be some hotheads out here. Matter of fact, I was kind of hoping for some fun along with the running. Maybe you are a steadying influence, Marshal. Now, you look here, young fella. Soldier uh, boy. Chester, no soldier. take it easy. Hey, Flag. Look over there. Well, if it isn't that old Kyle, a howling dog. <laughs> well, you want some fun? Hey, why not? Flag. He's going to challenge him to a race, Marshal. He's an old man, Lieutenant. Come on, Mal. We'll go talk to him. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? Uh, we'll go over, too. Flag's feeling mighty big right now and looking for trouble. All right. It looked to me like folks was all leaving a minute ago. Now they seem to be drifting back. Yeah. What do you think old Howland Dog is going to do? I don't know, Chester. This is Lieutenant Mao. I know Army officers. You speak good English for an Indian. 
I am chief of tribe. Chief? I hear you Kiowa ride good horses. Yeah. Horses help us hunt. And I hear they're fast. Now, you've been sitting here all afternoon. You saw the races. Yeah, I saw. You saw my horse run. You think any of your horses could beat him? Yes. Which one, Howling Dog? Your son's horses or the one you're riding? Any one. <laughs> any one of these three? <laughs> Here's one of them could run 400 yards and lift. <laughs> All right. All right, now stop deviling him, Flag. I'm not doing anything, Marshal. He tells me his horses can beat mine. I don't think they can. If you want to race, set one up, but don't fun him. Will you race my horse, Howling Dog? I will race. Which horse? The one I ride. <laughs> hey, Flag, do you ever see a sorrier sheep? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> you want to bet on the race, Howling Dog? Kiowa got no money. Well, you must have something. If I lose, I give you a horse. I <laughs> wouldn't want it. But I'll take that little beaded sack you're wearing around your neck. Yeah, that Indian medicine. You say you could beat me, so there's nothing to worry about. If I lose, I give army man medicine sack. Good. Well, I'll get Sergeant Crockett to bring my horse over here, will you? Right now, Howling Dog, what distance do we race? You say. All right. We'll race from here down to that wagon with the broken wheel and back again. That's about 500 yards. Marshal, you can mark the start and finish. All right. Now, Howling Dog, do you understand? From here to the wagon and then back again. The first man to pass me coming back wins. Yeah. Here you are, Flag. Had a chance to blow. Good shape. Good. Uh, Lieutenant Mao, would you step over here a minute? I'd like to talk to you. Sure, Marshal. You ready, Chief? I am ready. <laughs> you can ride dressed like that? Yes. Okay, Marshal. Fine with me. <laughs> hey, Flag. That Indian gonna ride in his blanket? He can ride in a tent for all I care. <laughs> uh, army man. Yes? What you give me when I win? When you... <laughs> what do you want? Money? No. What then? Uniform. Yeah. You mean what I'm wearing? Yes. Well... Oh, why not, Flag? What difference does it make? He won't win anyway. All right. It's a bet, Chief. Just a minute, Lieutenant. What is it, Pelcher? Well, my horse couldn't do it. Maybe the Chief's can. I ain't got any money left, but I'll bet my saddles and wagon and four mules against 500. It's a bet. All right. Chester. Yes, sir. You hold the money, huh? Yes, sir. And I might just take about $5 on the Indian, too, Lieutenant. It's a bet. Anybody else? Anybody want to cover me? I've done all right today. I'll take a hundred. Well, you're a fool, but now well, it's a bet. As soon as I'm mounted, I'll be ready, Marshal. All right. You ready, Howling Dog? Ready. All right, now to that wagon and back across this line, then. Uh, you there? Would you ride down and clear those people out of the way, please? All right, move up on the line. Now, I'll fire one shot. All right, steady now. Come on, I'm looking at him go, Mr. Dillon. Come on, howling dog. Can he do it? I don't know, Chester. Looks like Clyde's ahead. Now, he's swinging wide for the wagon. Look in there, that ugly little pony can sure run. Yeah. Well, they're into the turn, Chester. Hey, Mr. Dillon, what happened? Well, the collar dog dropped his blanket. Well, he's naked as a jaybird. <laughs> Come on, you Indian, ride! Come on, Holland dog! Come on! He's doing it, Chester! He's doing it! He's doing it! He's doing it. <laughs> So hard, I got the hiccups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, it was a sight, a sight. I tell you, oh, there's nothing quite as ineffectual as a man in long johns. <laughs> You know, I imagine Lieutenant Flagg will have some explaining to do when Colonel Benson sees him. Oh, I wish I'd been there. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, no place for a lady, Kitty. <laughs> you know, Holland Dog just sat there while Flagg cursed and begged, but then when the lieutenant paid off, he just turned and rode away. <laughs> With most of the lieutenant's uniform draped around his shoulders. <laughs> you know, Mr. Dillon, he sure seemed pretty calm about it all. Well, he was sure enough of his horse, just... <laughs> sure he'd win, you mean? Well, sure. Oh, that's right. Well, why, Matt? Army horses are pretty good stock. Well, sure they are, Kenny, but there's always one around somewhere that's better, and Holland Dog has it. <laughs> well, if that horse is so good, Matt, why doesn't Holland Dog uh, clip him up some so he, he don't look like a goat? Doc, let me tell you something. <laughs> Holland Dog's been winning races with that horse for a long time now. He's been to half the army posts on the frontier. What? <laughs> he has? <laughs> well, That's right. Well, why don't people learn not to bet against him then? Well, Chester, because lots of them are like Lieutenant Flagg. they got to make fun of somebody that looks weaker or different than they do. Yeah. Well, now, Matt, you said you knew about this before. Yeah. Did you know old Howling Dog was going to win today out there? <laughs> well, Doc... I was just sure enough to win a $50 bet from Lieutenant Mull. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> see what the gentleman will have. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Mr. MacDonald, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Ralph Moody, Paul Savage, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, motion picture star Van Heflin plays Damon Runyon on the Radio Hall of Fame. Novelist Gene Fowler and Lionel Barrymore, both friends of the late Damon Runyon, take part in the dramatized tribute. Remember, over CBS Radio tomorrow night, listen to a tribute to the beloved writer of short stories. It's on the Radio Hall of Fame on most of these stations of the Star's Address. George Walsh speaking. Coming, going, staying at home, enjoy music and song on a Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon, come over here at the window and take a look at this fella. I'm busy, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but you just got to. Well, he's the doggonest thing you ever saw. Please, Mr. Dillon, before he goes away. Well, I can't write while you're talking. Look at that. 
See? In the coonskin hat across the street there. Uh, Why, he looks to be eight feet tall. That's because he's so skinny. And that long rifle. Looks like a fish pole. (laughs) How's he going to shoot buffalo with that? He's a squirrel hunter, Chester. That's a southern mountain man. That fellow he's talking to now is pointing this way. Oh, oh, here he comes. Howdy. Hello. Well, come on in. Be you the... Uh, what you call him? Oh, the marshal? Uh, I'm again schools and education. Never heard nothing called a marshal. Uh, I'm a peace officer. I'm a country man. I'm again towns, too, and jailhouses. Well, so am I, but sometimes they're necessary. No, they ain't. No more than the law is. It ain't fitting for some folks to be meddling in other folks' business. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, uh, where do they figure it like that, stranger? The uh, Ozark Mountains? Better country than this. My name's Luke Humbird. Mine's Dillon. Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Uh, how do you do? I know the fella called Proudfoot once. That so? Yeah. Well, there ain't too many of us. That... Might be a relation of some kind. All I remember is how he crimped up every time I kicked him in the belly. He did? Marshal, man outside said you'd help me find where Hank Witherspoon's living. Witherspoon? Yeah. Oh, the one who came out here about a year ago? He's got an old mountain gal with him. They're married. Sure, I know them. They got a place up near Rock Springs, about ten miles north of here. What kind of place? Oh, just a shack on a patch of corn, as I remember. I'll find it. Well, you come a long way to see your friends, Humbird. The Witherspoon ain't exactly a friend, Marshal. I got to get going, it being Saturday and all. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? What are you talking about? Nothing. Except I won't kill no man on a Sunday, Marshal. I never have, and I never will. Do you think Humbird meant what he said, Mr. Dillon? Uh, he's too mountain simple to lie, Chester. Yes, sir. Hey, look, there's Miss Witherspoon now out in the corn patch. Yeah, I guess it'd be polite to stop and say hello to her first. Come on. Witherspoon. Howdy, Marshal. You too, Chester. All right, ma'am. Poorly. Hank's done healed it into Dodge, Marshal. Don't you know today's Saturday? Oh, what's Saturday got to do with it? Every Saturday Hank's in Dodge. He don't come back till Sunday night. Well, that's funny. I don't recall seeing him in town much. He's got his ways, Hank has. He goes to town, but he ain't too sociable. I see. Uh, Miss Witherspoon... Do you and Hank know a man called Luke Humbird? Humbird? Don't say his name around us, Marshal. Oh, there's trouble between you? Trouble. Marshal, Hank's only Witherspoon left, and Luke's only Humbird. Both families been whittled down to just them two. Oh, a feud, huh? Their grandpa started it. Now there's only one man left on each side. Well, don't you think it's gone far enough? Anchor Humbird. Either one of them could call it off, only they're both too muley for that. Well, didn't Hank come out here to, uh, well, get away from it? Of course not. He's always talking about going back long enough to kill Luke Humbird. Uh, How'd this feud start, ma'am? Well... They say Hank's grandpa stopped by the Humbirds one day, and they asked him to set and eat. He did. Dinner was slow cooking, and he got to hollering about it. Sat there pounding on the table with his knife just a faunching and a slavering for his vittles until Luke Humbird's grandpa, he took offense and told them not to feed him at all. He went off mad. They've been feuding ever since. Well, forever... You mean they're still fighting over that? 
course they are. Where'd you see Luke Humbird? Oh, he was in Dodge asking about Hank. That's bad, Marshal. Hank don't even know he's around. Well, that's why I came out here. Hank ought to be told. He's better shot than Humbird any day. Look, Miss Witherspoon, the law doesn't recognize a feud as justification for murder. If one of them kills the other, he's going to hang for it. I never heard tell of no such law, Marshal. You're making that up. No, it's it's true, Miss Witherspoon. I've warned Humbird, and I'm going to warn Hank. They'll shoot you. You start meddling. These people just don't understand nothing, Mr. Dillon. I'm worried about Hank. He'll be drunk as soon as it's dark. Oh, well, I'll I'll find him. Goodbye, ma'am. You better find him, Marshal. He'll get killed, sure, if you don't. Yeah. Come on, sister. Are hill people all like that, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, they're mighty independent, Chester. They're mighty crazy, if you ask me. Why, it's like they don't even hear what you're saying. Well, I guess anything to do with the law is a new experience for them. Now, look over there, Chester. Huh? By that little bluff over to your right there. Well, I'll... How'd he get out here? Well, let's go ask him. Hello, Humbird. That Witherspoon's place, Marshal. You don't care whether you hang or not, do you? For shooting a Witherspoon? For shooting anybody. Marshal, you're getting downright contrary. Humbird, why don't you take that squirrel rifle and go on back home? Because it ain't no squirrel rifle, that's why. This here is a human rifle, Marshal. Oh, there's no use even talking to him, Mr. Dillon. Where's your horse, Humbert? Uh, how did you get out here, anyway? I come afoot. I don't need no horse to travel by. You mean you walked all the way from the Ozarks? It ain't far. When they weather spoon to waiting at the end of it. Uh, maybe I ought to just throw you in jail for a while. Well, then nobody get killed, Marshal. At least not till I got out again. But you're being awful meddlesome. I gotta get closer to that house. So long. Now don't worry. I don't aim to shoot his old lady. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Maybe it'd be better if you just let them shoot each other and have done with it. Don't tempt me, Chester. Well, let's go find Witherspoon. <laughs> go ask Sam if he's seen Witherspoon, Chester. All right, sir. Oh, Matt. How are you, Kitty? Things have been pretty quiet around here for Saturday night. Well, I'm not complaining about it. The Santa Fe agent told me there's a big Texas herd due to be shipped out of here in a couple of days. Well, those boys will liven things up for you. Yeah, for you, too, I expect. Where you been, Matt? It's pretty near midnight. Kitty, I've been trying to stop a feud. A feud? Yeah. What kind of feud? An old one. There's only one man left on each side. <laughs> been a long time since I've heard of a feud around Dodge. Well, this one kind of got transplanted from the Ozarks. Oh. Say, don't tell me that crazy Hank Witherspoon's mixed up in it. I've been trying to find him all evening. You know where he hides out? <laughs> I bet you a dollar he's right out back, Matt. What? Regular as clockwork. Every Saturday night he comes in carrying a long rifle and buys a bottle of corn from Sam and takes it out back and drinks it. All alone, as far as I know. He just sits there, looking at the moon and drinking his whiskey. Never causes any trouble. Eh? Well, no wonder I never see him around. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I know, sir. Chester. Kitty just told me. Go see if he's there. Bring him in, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, who's he feuding with, Matt? A fellow by the name of Luke Humbird. I never heard of him. He just arrived today on foot. 
On foot? Yeah, he's all legs, Kitty. A real traveling man. Well, if he's anything like as weird as Hank Witherspoon, you've got a problem on your hands. Yeah, I know. Well, here he is, Mr. Dillon. I made him leave his rifle outside. Hello, Hank. Now, what do you want with me, Marshal? I don't like it all cooped up in here. Hank, Luke Humbird is looking for you. <laughs> oh, I'm birds in the way their spoons been looking for each other nigh on to 40 years, Marshal. They most all got found. How drunk are you, Hank? Well, Marshal, my old woman won't allow no drinking on the place, so I got to come into town every Saturday. Hank Witherspoon. It's Humbird, Mr. Dillon. I got you caught like a bar up a tree, Hank. But... Down that rifle, Humbert. Is it going to kill me? I ain't even got my gun. Put it down, I said. Get out of the way, Marshal. I'll shoot you, too, if you don't. Now, you listen to me. Hey, w- wait wait a minute, everybody. I just thought of something. Why don't all you folks stop a meddling in this? It's after midnight, Humbert. What? It's Sunday. Sunday? Oh, no. Yeah, he's right, Humbert. Well, of all the gall blame luck, now I'll have to put off killing you, Hank. I won't shoot a man on Sunday. Even a witherspoon. Well, of course you won't. Hey, Luke, you sure travel a long ways. Well, I got tired waiting for you to come back home. I was figuring coming back this summer for a spell. Long. I know. I seen your old lady scratching around in that corn patch. She said she ain't never going back hard as it is here. Oh, well, fellers can make a crop here sometimes, Luke. Yeah. But it's a hard fight. With a short stick. You got no hogs out there. Where are your hogs, Hank? I'll be getting some. Oh. Hey, Luke. I'll tell you something. What? I got me a little jug out back. It's most empty now, but we could maybe buy us another one and sit out there for a spell and kind of... kind of get soured on the cob. We might as well. We can't do no shooting till Monday. Where do we buy this whiskey? I'll show you. Feller over here, he sells it. You'll have to lend me some money, Hank. I didn't bring none with me. Well, if that don't beat all... Matt, why don't you put him in a cage and send them back where they came from? I'd like to, Kitty. People here are getting quite a kick out of this. Yeah, I know. Those two hillbillies are making me look like a fool, and I don't know what to do about it. And the limb's about as easy as trying to stop it from raining. Well, I'm going to bed. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... Listen, Young Lovers is the title of Monday night's drama on Suspense on CBS Radio, starring Robert Wagner and Mona Freeman. Don't miss Suspense and one of its greatest productions, Listen, Young Lovers, on most of these stars' address stations Monday night. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Chester, Ralph? Uh, he went across the street for a beer, Doc. He ought to be back soon. Well, it can wait till morning. Oh, well, Matt, I've been hearing all day about your feuding mountaineers. Yeah, they've been drunk all day, lying around out back of the Texas Trail. The shooting won't start till midnight. Oh, you're going to let them uh, go ahead with it? Well, I've about decided to throw them in jail. Give me time to think of some way to get rid of them. Well, that's a good idea, Matt. <laughs> Uh, people are saying that this is the first time you've run into something that you can't handle. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're kind of enjoying it, too. Yeah, I'll bet they are. <laughs> yeah, and all over a couple of crazy... <laughs> 
What's that? That was a rifle shot, Doc. A long-barreled human rifle. Now, you might as well come along. I thought they were against shooting each other on Sunday, Matt. I thought they were, too, Doc. Maybe they got so drunk they forgot. Yeah, but it sure, sure looks that way. Now, watch your step, Doc. It's pretty dark back here. Over here, Mr. Dillon. His Humbird got shot. I was right inside when I heard it. Oh, that's over here. Here, Let me take a look at it. What's the matter with Hank, Chester? He looks like he's been shot, too. Too much corn whiskey, I guess. Yeah. Uh, scoop some water out of that rain barrel there and throw it on him, huh? What? What's that you're doing now, Luke? Give him huh? some more, Chester. Okay. Oh. Hey, now, stop that, I tell you. You're making me all wet. Say, say, man, this man over here is still alive. Uh, let's get him over to my office. Uh, give Doc a hand there, a couple of you men, huh? Oh, I can't. Luke, huh? Give me a where at's my rifle? I got your rifle right here, Hank. Did you shoot him, Hank? Well, sure. I was aiming to, I guess. How could you shoot him if you were passed out? Well, I don't know, Marshal. We got pretty drunk. I thought neither of you would shoot a man on Sunday. Well, no, of course not. Why did you, then? You mean it's still Sunday? Hank, I don't believe you did this. Marshal, you quit messing around. I'll shoot you next. Chester. Yes, sir. Throw him in jail. I'm going to take a look around. Jail? I ain't going to jail. Come on, quit. get moving, Hank. No. Come on, I'll poke this rifle right through. Hey, quit that. Well, then start walking. If you put me in jail, I'll just bust right out again. Oh, no, you won't. Not if I have to break your leg. Who's that? All right, hold it right there. Hold it or I'll shoot. All right, that's better. Now get your hands up. Well, I'll be... I ain't armed, Marshal. Put your hands down, Ms. Witherspoon. What are you chasing me for? I'm a woman, Marshal. Come along, ma'am. I'll put you in the same cell with your husband. Well, I just give them their breakfast, Mr. Dillon. Hello, Doc. Morning, Chester. How's Luke Humbird doing? Well, I was just telling Matt. It's like shooting a bullet through water with that man. Oh, he's not about to die. Yeah, that's good news, I guess. <sighs> well, I'm going to talk to the Witherspoons. You two waiting here, huh? Morning, Hank. Ma'am. Morning, Marshal. You come on out to our place someday, Marshal. I'll cook you a better breakfast than you give us here. Uh, thanks, ma'am. But it might be a long time before... You go home. I've been trying to explain things to Hank, Marshal. Oh? He's still arguing he shot Lou Cumberg. But even he don't believe it. You're admitting that you did? Of course I did. You know it. Hank is too drunk. Humbert's all right. He's going to live. But you'll still have to stand trial for attempted murder, Miss Witherspoon. Judge ain't going to do nothing to a woman. What'd you go do it for anyways? Feuding is a man's job. I got to thinking, that's why. I'm worrying. About what? About you being too drunk to fight come Monday. And when I seen you laying around out back there, I knowed I was right, so I took your rifle and shot him. Don't you know if you'd killed Humbert and I hadn't caught you, Hank would hang for this. You're still saying that, Marshal. Oh, don't pay him no mind, woman. Hey, Marshal, when are you gonna let me out of here? So you can go shoot Luke Humbert? No. No, you're staying here, Hank. You can't keep him locked up, Marshal. Yes, I can. No. Man. No. It's all a mistake. I didn't have to shoot Luke at all. What? Well, the reason they got so drunk was they were celebrating. Celebrating what? They decided to call the feud off, Marshal. Both of them at the same time. 
Luke Humberg's going to come out, go to work for Hank, and he's going to live on the place. They got it all figured out. They is too drunk to tell me. Uh, Mrs. Witherspoon. Huh? I'll go talk to the judge, if you'll do me a favor. Huh? Why, sure, Marshal. Go on home and take Hank with you, and I'll send Humbert out as soon as he's well enough to travel and keep him out of Dodge, will you? Please, both of them. Sure, I will. Come on, Hank. Your drinking days is over. <laughs> Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, John Daner, and Lawrence Dubkin, Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in... Gun smoke. Here's a tip make it a safe, sane holiday weekend all the way. Let the drivers in Indianapolis take the only chances anyone takes this entire holiday weekend. And say, don't forget CBS Radio will bring you Memorial Day night, an exclusive program of Indianapolis Thrills. That's Monday night on most of these same stations. Roy Rowan speaking. Lionel Barrymore's Radio Hall of Fame is great Sunday night drama on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Sure do thank you for that breakfast, Mr. Dillon. Forget it, Chen. My steak, eggs, potatoes, and a glass of beer. Why, that could last a man clean to noon dinner. <laughs> I guess it could. Mr. Dillon, you figure Amy will have your horse shod by the time we get there? I should. 
You think he's done him any good? He's a good blacksmith, Chester. If he trimmed up his feet right before he reset those shoes, he ought to be fine. Funny the way he took throwing his foreleg. Yeah. Now, it looks like there's somebody else waiting. Yeah. Gil Tolman, yeah. ain't it? Yeah, I think it is. I'm telling you something else, Dutchman. You can whistle for your money. You won't get it from me. All right. I don't make you pay. The morning after I got him home, he was so lame he couldn't walk. I'd have break your head. Please, if it was my fault, something I did wrong, don't pay me anything. That seems fair enough, Tolman. Oh. Well, Marshal, this fool Dutchman messed up my pony, and then he wants to get paid on top of it. Well, maybe it's a stone bruise. Any no oh, stone bruise, Marshal. It's pinched feet, that's what. Is uh, that the horse you're talking about? Why, no, no, he's back at the place. This is another one. How about my horse, Amo? You finished with him? All finished. Now he walks good. Ah, fine. Well, how much I owe you? Uh, Two dollars all right, Marshal? Sure. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Chester, Hmm? you get up behind. I'll ride you back to the office. Come on. There we go. Uh, Marshal. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Tolman uh, told lie. Oh? Yeah, the horse he ride just now is the one I shoot two days ago. You can see he's not lame. He didn't seem to be. There's sure nothing wrong the way he traveled. Amo, why is Tolman who on you, huh? Do you know? Maybe because I'm German. Maybe something else. Who knows? And I'll ask him to settle his bill with you if you like. No. No, Marshal. <laughs> well, you won't get rich if you aren't paid, Emil. Uh, money is good, yeah, but better to have no enemies. <laughs> All right, Emil. Well, Chester, hang on. Get out. Get out. Mercy on us! <laughs> Mr. Dillon? What, Chester? Did you know that Lily Lankry's going to be here in a couple of weeks? Oh, how did you know? Mr. Hipple over at the Opera House told me. Oh. And in case I don't get to see her, he's going to let me have one of them big picture posters. He is? Yes, sir, the Jersey Lily. My, I sure would like to be tall hog at that trough. <laughs> oh, hello, Martin, Chester. Hello, Doc. Hello, Doc. Hey, did you know Lily Lankry's going to be here, Doc? Oh, of course, Chester. I already paid Hipple for a chair. Oh. <laughs> oh, is this all you two have got to do? Just sit around and talk? Well, things are quiet, Doc. We can't always have a few shot-up cowboys just to keep you busy. Besides, we're waiting for the evening stage. Wish I had the loan of a door. Maybe I'd get to see the Lily, too. Uh... Chester, here. Oh, no, sir. Here's a dollar. Now, will you be quiet? Well, sir, I sure do thank you, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Marshal Dillon? Oh, Amo, come in, come in. I just come by to see how your horse is. Oh, fine, Amo, fine. I think that shoe and fixed him up. Good. Hey, you're all dressed up, Amo. You got your Sunday clothes on. <laughs> yeah. I'm meeting stage five o'clock. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Got, uh... You wife coming. Huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, you got one? It's right. Well, I didn't know you were married, Amo. Oh, not yet married. I will get married after she arrives. Well, forevermore. Who is it, Amo? Well, uh, I am doing good now. I want to have wife and children. But girls here in Dodge don't want husbands. They like better the Texas Trail and Longhorn. Well, there's a lot of excitement and money to be had working around the saloon, eh? That's true. So I answer advertisement in St. Louis paper. You did what? Advertisement. Says the young German woman wants husband. So I write to the paper and say, come to Dodge City, be wife of Emil Volheta. And she's coming in on this evening's stage. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, oh, it's, oh that's just fine, Emil. You got a place for her to stay? Yeah, I talked to Mr. Green at the Dodge house. Now. She'll stay there until I get a place ready behind my smithy. It's here. The stage just pulled up the other side of the plaza. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> well, good luck, Amo. Oh. oh. Marshal. Marshal, you and Doc and Chester come too. I want you to meet Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll be proud, eh? Yeah. <laughs> you? Funny thing, I, I'm not afraid of anything. But now, my, my stomach is sick. <laughs> yeah, there's only one woman getting off the stage. That must be her. <sighs> yeah? Ooh, she's a pretty little thing, ain't she? Ooh. Well, go on, Abel. She's standing there waiting. Oh, we'll stay here. Go on. Well, uh, 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 well, go on, man. Go on, go on. There's ooh. plenty of time to be nervous later. Oh, well, well. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. And I'm happy to be here. Come on. Makes you wonder how they can understand each other, don't it? Talk in that way. Oh, just for heaven's sake. Oh, look, he's bringing her over here. Speaking the English, Fräulein Kitchen? Yeah, naturally. Ah, good, good. Marshal Dillon, gentlemen, Miss Gretchen. How do you do, gentlemen? <laughs> How do? Ah. How do you do, ma'am? Welcome to Dodge, Miss Schiller. Oh, thank you, Marsha. I hope you'll be happy here. Uh, you certainly got a fine man. I know much about him already. We have written. Now, Marshal, I will take Gretchen to the hotel. Uh, uh, come and see. Again, it's Gretchen. Well, here. <laughs> Ah, oh, she seems a little scared, doesn't she, Matt? Now, oh, Doc, she took a chance on coming out here. Yeah, well, so did Amo. Getting married to a mail order bride like buying a pig and a poke. You can't be sure till it's too late. Oh, for the oh, come on, Matt. This is an excuse for some sort of a celebration. I'll buy you a glass of rye. <laughs> hey, you too, Chester. All right, Doc. Since you're buying, you know I was just thinking. She's so little and Emil's so big, I hope he don't take it into his mind to beat her none. Now, Emil's about the gentlest man I've ever known, Chester. And besides, Chester, men don't always beat their wives. My pa did. <laughs> well, well, well. Sam, set out some glasses and a bottle of rye whiskey. And so then when the stage comes in a few minutes ago, I see where he gets himself a gal bought out of a newspaper. <laughs> Gil Tolman One again, Mr. Dillon. One of them foreigners is yeah. all we need around here. Now there's two. We ought to tar and feather the both of them and send them on their way. All right, all right. Doc. You and Chester wait here. Darn feathers is too good for foreigners that are trying to take over the town. Yes, sir. You're right. Dolman, how drunk are you? I ain't at all. Now you talk like a man that's been drinking. Ain't a man allowed to say what he thinks around Dodge no more, Marshal? Not when he's thinking that way, Tolman. This is between Wall Hater and me. It has nothing to do with the law. It's got a lot to do with me, Tolman. Now you drink up and get out. And you take Spooner and Willie here with you. Now, just a minute. Now you listen to me. All of you. Wall Hater's trying to mind his own business. And if there's any trouble, I'll know who started it. And he'll go to jail. You saying you're going to lock me up? Tolman, if Emil Woolhater ever gets mad enough, he'll kill you with his bare hands. Now leave him and his girl alone. <laughs> girl. Why, she's probably nothing but a little... Oh. All right, Tolman. You and Spooner carry Willie out of here. Okay, Marshal. We'll go. Just remember, I got a score to settle with that blacksmith. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... Later tonight, CBS Radio's Gangbusters again recreates a dramatic, spine-tingling, factual history of the pursuit and apprehension of some of the world's most dangerous criminals. 
Tonight's program reveals the story of a strange stick-up gang which comes to no good end in the case of the close-knit family. It's another story based on actual police files telling the truth about criminals and crime. Don't miss the case of the close-knit family on gangbusters over most of these same stations later tonight. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. By the end of the next week, Emil Wohater had finished fixing up the little room out behind his smithy. And the week after that, he married Gretchen Schiller. On their wedding night, they made quite a picture, standing there by the fire out behind the smithy. The great giant of a man and his tiny little bride, smiling and happy. Doc had come along, too, and he was busy with his fiddle. People were laughing and eating and drinking. Somebody had brought along a barrel of beer, and there were hard-boiled eggs and pickled pig's feet, roast chicken, and smoked beef. Some of the women had brought sugar cakes and dried apple pie, and some of the men, whiskey. It was good fun, until Tolman and his sidekicks arrived. Well, I didn't think he'd show up here, Mr. Dillon. No, neither did I. Where's the dancing? He's kind of drunk. Yeah, so are Willie and Spooner. Willie, go find yourself a gal. You too, Spooner. Me, I got one waiting. I'm going to dance with this little old gal. How about it, Mrs. Woolader? Amy? Come on, gal, dance. He don't care. Amy. We are all friends here. But I... Nobody's dancing right now, Tolman. Why don't you forget it, huh? Well, if it ain't the marshal. You are welcome here, Mr. Tolman. There's food on the table and drink. I don't want nothing to drink. I want to dance. Doc, start that fiddle playing. Come on, you. We're going to dance. Maybe you would drink too much to dance. Don't you lay a hand on me. Why don't you just go home, Tolman, and sleep it off? Me and Gretchen's gonna dance, that's why. Come on. I'm sorry to do this, Mr. Tolman. Hurry down. But now we put you in the water trough. Put me down. Cool you off. <laughs> you stupid ox. Put me down. All right. There you go. <laughs> That'll quiet him some, Abel. <laughs> Better than hurting him, I think. You filthy Dutchman. I'll pay you back for that. Come on, Willie. Spooner, let's go. Everybody, have fun. No troubles on wedding night of Gretchen and Abel. <laughs> And there wasn't any more trouble that night, or in the week that followed. I kept my eyes open, but there was no sign of Tallman or his two wranglers, and Dodge was pretty peaceful. Then late one night, trouble did come, but not the way I'd expected it. I'd fallen asleep on a cot in the office. Mr. Dillon? Uh, Mr. Dillon? What? what? Wake up, Mr. What? Dillon. Well, what's the matter? What's the matter, Jack? There's a fire. What? It's the blacksmith shop. I, I come as quick as I could. Well, well is it bad? Yes, sir. A bunch of the men are out there now. Where's Amo? I don't know. Nobody's seen him. How about Gretchen? Miss Kitty, it's her. She's pretty upset. Oh. By the time we got bucket lines going, the place is just about burned to the ground. Uh, well, how did it start? Do you know? No, sir, I don't. But a shack like that flares up pretty quick. They didn't have time to get anything out, beds or tables or the like. Well... There doesn't seem to be much left but a pile of coals. Look at the ring. Oh, there's Miss Kitty. Over there. And Gretchen. Yeah. Oh, Matt. Mrs. Walter. Kitty. Oh, Marshal. He's gone. All gone. And Amy works so hard. Now, it's going to be all right, Miss Walter. Kitty, yeah. uh, why don't you take her on over to your place? Huh? Oh, that's a good idea. Come on, honey. Oh, no, no, no. I, I can't. 
Amber will be back. He'll be right. Well, the marshal can tell him where you are. Where is your husband, Gretchen? He was called away. Oh? When? A few hours ago. A man came for him. Said he was needed. Well, who was it? He was one of the men who came our wedding night. Oh, she means the night of the chivalry match. Yeah. That must have been Willie or Spooner. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Gretchen! I Gretchen Liebchen! Liebchen, bist du beleidigt? Oh, Emil, the God. He was so bon spiel. Emil, Gretchen uh, Liebchen. It burned too fast. Uh, the men uh, couldn't get water to it. Yeah, I know, Marshal. I've heard, but Gretchen is safe. Uh, yeah. That is important. I'm going to take her with me, Mr. Woolhead. You're very kind, Miss Kitty. Right now, she needs a woman. Yeah. Come on, Gretchen. Let's oh, yeah. go. Yeah. All right. Marshal, I think somebody set that fire. Well, why do you think so, Emil? Somebody wanted me away from my place. So he told me I was needed down the trail towards Willow Bend. But there was no team of horses with thrown shoes. So maybe you just missed him in the dark. Well, didn't the man who came for you wait to lead you back? No, he rode on. By the time I dressed, he was gone. Did you know him, Emil? Yeah. It was the man Spooner. He works with Tolman. No, he works for Tolman. Yeah, and Tolman is just mean enough to do it. He is. Look, Emil, if you'll say that Tolman did it, I'll have him in jail by morning. No, no, Marshal. No, this I settle myself. I won't have any killing, Emil. Ah, no, no, there will be no killing, Marshal, but for the first time, I am getting very angry. Not so much for me, but for little Gretchen. Oh, what are you going to do? I will wait. And when I see Tolman, I will teach him lesson. You want more coffee, Mr. Dillon? Uh, no, 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 thanks, Chester. Did you know Emma Woolhater's been just standing across the plaza there all morning? He's waiting, Chester. Waiting? Yeah, it's Saturday, and Tolman always comes to town Saturday for his week's supplies. He probably figures if he didn't come in this morning, people would suspect he was afraid to. Yep. My golly, Emma's still there. Just standing. You think Tolman knows Emma's after him? I don't know, Chester. Mm. Mr. Dillon? Yeah? He's coming. Tolman's coming. Huh? And he's got Willie Sachs and Spooner with him. Come on, Chester. Let's step out onto the porch, huh? I think we need a little air. Yes, sir. Hey, look. Look at the three of them. Walking right down the middle of the plaza. Yeah. Oh, uh, Tolman! Come over here a minute, huh? Why, sure, Marshal. What do you want? Tolman! That crazy Dutch. All right, Tolman, you and your men drop your guns. Well, now, wait a minute, Marshal. Drop them, I said. That's better. Now, gentlemen, I think the blacksmith wants to talk with you. What? Mr. Tolman. I don't mind when you don't pay me for work. I don't mind when you are a little drunk. But when you do something to upset my wife, I mind very much. What are you talking about? I... I'm going to fight you, Tolman, and hurt you. You lay a hand on me and Spooner and Willie here will tear you to pieces. I don't want to fight other men, but if they try to stop me, it's too bad. You are crazy. No, just very mad. I'll see that they come at you only one at a time. Please, Amos. Marshal, you stay out of it, out. If they want to come at me at the same time, let them. Boys, get the deck rip. Oh. 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 
Some of you men there, will you help Doc carry these three men up to his That's place? That's right. Young fella, get the feet there. Get, 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 get Careful now, Carrie. Watch their heads against the stairs. Get that man's face out of the dust. My gracious alive, I never seen nothing like it. Yeah. Well, Emil, mm-hmm. you, uh, you want Doc to have a look at you? <laughs> no. No, no worse than shoeing Missouri mule. No, no, Marshal. I go to Gretchen. It is time we start building new home. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Mr. MacDonald, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, and Luke Krugman. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, Fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. When rustlers are on the loose, Gene Autry isn't long getting on their trail tomorrow night on most of these same CBS stations. Don't miss Gene's adventure titled Maisie's Boys. And a hard lot you'll find them, too. It's the Gene Autry Show with songs by the Melody Ranchers and Adventure 2 tomorrow night at the Star's Address. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. That's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal.
Johnny Marshall. Good morning, ma'am. Kitty. Hello, Matt. <laughs> I didn't see you, said Matt. Well, I know. Sit down, sit down. Uh -huh. There you are. How do you like my outfit? Well, I never saw you in a riding skirt before, Kitty. <laughs> You've been riding side saddle? For the first time in my life. <laughs> At least I know how to do it now, in case I'm ever called on to be a lady. <laughs> well, I know ladies who don't always ride side saddle. Sure. Like that female wildcat down in the panhandle you told me about. What's her name? Oh, Bell Star. I bet she never rides side saddle. <laughs> oh, Bell Star's a lady, though. And everybody treats her like one. <laughs> Even though she has to use a six gun to make them do it. <laughs> Maybe I ought to try that. Yeah, it takes more than a six gun to make a lady, Kitty. That's a funny way of putting it. Uh, well, that isn't what I Mr. Dillon? Uh, hello, Miss Kitty. How are you, Chester? Hey, I just come to Longhorn there, Mr. Dillon. What, uh, trouble, Chester? Uh, not yet, but there's going to be as soon as Art Long gets to town. Art Long? Well, he's always been a peaceful man. Isn't he one of those nesters out near Sam Baxton's ranch? That's him. But it's another one of them nesters that's talking up trouble. A fellow named Hoffer. He's saying he's going to shoot Art Long on sight. Well, is he drunk, Chester? Yes, sir, some. Armed? He's got the biggest old cavalry pistol you ever saw stuck right in his belt. Real farmer style. Well, that may be true, Kitty, but those horse pistols go off sometimes. Well, bye later, Matt. Yeah, I will if I can, Kitty. So long, he sure sounds like he means it, Mr. Dillon. Oh, why does he want to kill Long, Chester? Well, sir, he didn't say. Yeah, maybe he's just drunk and wants to shoot somebody. No, anybody. Sir. No, sir. He Hopper's pretty certain about who it's going to be. All right, Chester. Uh, don't stand too close in case he puts up a fight, huh? No, sir. And all you bully clubs, shut up and listen to me. When Art Long gets here, you're going to see his blood all over the floor. Right there. Or maybe right over there. Uh, I don't know just where yet. Your name Hoffer? Barnaby Hoffer. What's the trouble between you and Art Long? You friend of his? That doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Because if you're a real good friend, I might take it to mind to shoot you, too. I'm a U.S. Marshal, mister, and you're not going to shoot anybody. Oh, Marshal Dillon, huh? I'll take that pistol, Hoffer. Okay, Marshal. Take it. All right. Now tell me what this is all about. I don't need no pistol. I He's got, got a knife, Mr. Dillon! <laughs> Drop it, Hoffer. I said drop it. No. I'm going to cut you again. Give me that knife back. You're kind of hard to convince, Hoffer. Did he, did he cut you bad, Mr. Dillon? Oh, he opened up my arm a little bit, Chester. I better go see Doc. You throw him in jail. Yes, sir, I sure will. There's a saying that it's the gentle horse that's most dangerous. You don't watch him close enough. And so with Barnaby Hoffer, a farmer who hands you his old horse pistol and then snatches an eight-inch knife from the back of his belt. Well, Doc took a few stitches in my arm and told me to come back in a couple of days. And I did. And it looked pretty good by then. At least I thought so. You're going to have to watch that cut, Matt. There might be an infection in it. What are you talking about, Doc? Looks as clean as rain to me. Well, how do you know what that idiot's been using his knife on? Probably sticks hogs with it all day and uses it to clean his boots at night. Yeah, sure, but my arm bled a lot. That got it clean. That and uh, all the turpentine you poured into it. Hurt, didn't it? You know, someday, Doc, if my luck holds, I'm going to get a chance to work on you. Oh, no, you know, I'd sooner die. I'd sooner lie in the snow and bleed to death all alone. Without anybody around even to bury me. <laughs> How did you get in the snow, Doc? Oh, I just hate snow. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot. Oh, come in, come in. Come in. Oh, hello, Chester. Hey, Doc, hey, Mr. Dillon, Art Long's been killed. What? Yes, sir. A cowboy just came into the office and told me. 
Said he rode by his cabin this afternoon, and he found him there laying right in the door. Barnaby Hoffer must have done it. Hoffer? I thought you had him in jail, Matt. Well, I turned him loose next morning, Doc. He seemed calm enough then. I guess I made a mistake. I guess you did, all right. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have stopped to bury Art Long. Arthur may be a long way from here by now. Uh, we couldn't leave him lying there, Chester. No, sir, I guess not. Poor fella. Well, there's Hoffer's cabin. Yes, yeah, sir. Hey, we've done pretty good at that. It's hardly past daylight. Looks like his door's open. Yeah, then he must be inside. He wouldn't go off and leave his door open. No. Hey, wait a minute. Look hmm. over there, Chester. Why, it's him. Oh, he looks dead. Yeah. Come on. Oh. 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 He's been shot, Mr. Dillon. With a shotgun. Just like Art Law. At least still breathing. Hopper? Hoffer. It's Marshal Dillon, Hoffer. Uh, hey. Uh, Marshal. Huh? I'm tore all apart. Took a load of buckshot when I opened the door. Who did it, Hoffer? Did you see him? S Sam Baxton. He did it. Sam Baxton? Who killed Art Long, Hoffer? Did you? Art Long. Is he dead? Yeah. Bo both of us. Dead. <laughs> I don't want to die. Yeah, it's a wonder he lived this long. Gosh, Mr. Dillon, I, I just can't believe Sam Baxton done this. Why? Just because Baxton's a big rancher and pretty respectable? He's also a mean old devil. And these men are nesters. Come on, let's go find him, Chester. <laughs> Anybody home? Why, it's Marshal Dillon and Chester. Hello, Miss Oh, ma'am. Well, don't stand around out there. Come on in, said a while. Thank you, I got two pots of coffee on the stove. Well, we don't want to bother you now, Miss Baxton. Bother? Why, well, love company. And besides, you don't get out this way very often, Marshal. You're just going to have to stay and eat dinner with us. Sam! Sam, we got company. Hello, Baxton. What are you doing here, Marshal? Why, Sam, that's no way to... Shut up, woman. Oh, please, Sam, don't talk like that. Want to get whooped instead? Well, do you? No, Sam. I asked what you're doing here, Marshal. Yeah, yeah, I heard you. Well, say it out. We're busy around here. You know Art Long and Barnaby Hoffer? I know them, dirty nesters. Well, they're both dead, Baxton. Good. Oh, no. They both got killed the same way. What do I care how they got killed, as long as they're dead? I'm going to tell you anyway, Baxton. Each of them, when he came out of his cabin first thing in the morning, was killed by a man waiting outside with a shotgun. Oh, you know all that. You, you weren't there. Barnaby Hoffer was still alive when we got there, Baxton. Still alive? He died pretty quick, but before he did, he told me who shot him. Did he? And who was that, Marshal? You. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that's what he said. I'm going to have to arrest you, Baxton. Arrest me? On the word of a dead sodbuster? <laughs> Who's going to believe it? The court will decide that, but it's enough evidence to hold you on. What makes you think Hoffer wasn't lying? He knew he was going to die, and it was his last chance to get me in trouble. That's what happened. You'll get a trial, Baxton. You can defend yourself there. Right now, you're going to jail. I'm charging you with two murders. But Art Long was dead. 
He didn't tell you nothing, Marshal. He and Hoffer were killed exactly the same way, ma'am. Looks like one man killed both of them. Come on, Marshal. If we're going to jail, let's go. And you stay out here, woman. I don't want you running into Dodge all the time I'm there. All right, Sam. And don't go talking your fool head off to everybody about this either. I won't. When we get this business over with, Marshal, I'm going to give you a lot of trouble. You're going to wish you never come near me. As soon as I get Kitty fixed up here. Oh, Matt. Kitty. What's that, a black eye? What happened? It's none of your business. <laughs> How's your arm, Matt? His arm's all right, Kitty. Just comes up here to bother me. Well, somebody's got to keep you from sleeping all day, Doc. Oh, don't forget I'm making pretty good money off that cut of yours. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. Thanks, Doc. Matt, has Sam Baxton confessed yet? No, I've spent two days trying to get him to, but he won't admit a thing. Well, if he does hang, there won't be many tears shed around here. Yeah, there's Ms. Baxton, Kitty. For some reason, she really loves him. Oh, that poor woman. I've seen how he treats her. Too bad she hasn't got a son to stand up for. Some kid about eight feet tall. And he'd be about eight feet tall if he was Sam Baxton's. Well, that man's tall as a tree. Is he still wearing that white hat of his? Yeah, the only time he takes it off is when he sleeps, Kitty. Then he puts it over his face. Must be like sleeping under a horse blanket. No wonder he's so ornery all the time. <laughs> oh, come in. <laughs> well, come on in, friend. The fellow downstairs told me I could find the marshal up here. Well, what can I do for you, mister? Oh, I've never been in Dodge City before, marshal. I ain't even been in Kansas very long. I'm riding south. I got tired of that cold up north. Well, you're welcome here. Well, I'm going on south. Well, what I come to tell you was, there's a little creek runs out of our Kansas about 20 miles from here. A fellow told me it's called Ginger Creek. Yeah, that's up near Sam Baxter's ranch, man. That's on his ranch, according to him. What about Ginger Creek, mister? Now, some fellow's got a little cabin there with a corral out in back. Uh, I don't know his name. Now, that'll be Jim Fowler. He's been homesteading there for about a year. Now, no more he ain't. Well, what do you mean? I buried him myself early this morning. I come by and found him laying in the door of his cabin. He was dead, but still bleeding. Somebody's tore him plumb in two with a shotgun. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, Suspense, launches its new summer series Tuesday nights on most of these same stations with more spine chilling stories packed with excitement and well calculated to keep you in suspense. This Tuesday, here the earth is made of glass in which a man experiments with crime on a scientific basis. Suspense, now Tuesday nights at the Star's Address. Don't miss it. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Mr. Dillon, look at there. What, what is it, Chester? Uh, out there in the street. It's Miss Baxton. Huh? She's coming to bug you. Ah. News travels fast, doesn't it? You gonna turn old Sam Baxton loose? Well, I don't have much to hold him on now, Chester. No, sir. Not with him right here in jail when that last fellow was killed the same way as Art Long and Hoffer. Shucks, I guess he was telling the truth after all. Yeah, it looks that way. Well, I'm glad for Miss Baxton anyway. I'll open the door for her. Well, 
Morning, Miss Baxton. Hello, Chester. Hey, come right on in, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, Miss Baxton. Marshal Dillon, I, I'm sure glad to see you this time. Well, I hope there aren't any hard feelings, ma'am. Oh, you was only doing your duty. I respect that. Oh, where's Sam? Oh, the cells are out back. Oh, you haven't turned him loose yet? Uh, no, ma'am. It's too bad about Jim Fowler Marshall being killed that way. But it was just like the others, wasn't it? The same man killed all three of them. And Sam was right here in jail. Well, I was just saying to Chester, news sure travels fast. How'd you hear about it so soon? It just happened this morning. What? One of our cowboys rode by there about noon, Marshal. He comes straight to the ranch and told me about it. Would you let Sam out now? I'd like to get started for home. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Baxton, but uh, I'm going to have to hold him for a while yet. But why, Marshal? What for? Well, Mr. Dillon, a few minutes ago, you said yourself... That I you... said that he wasn't clear of this yet, Chester. You don't listen very close, Chester. No, sir, I... I sure don't. Marshal, you said that whoever killed Hopper killed Art Long, since they was both shot the very same way. Well, I know I did, ma'am, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, and I'm uh, just not sure yet. Even with the same thing happening again this morning? Well, I got to admit, that does make a difference, all right. I suppose if one more man got killed like that, I wouldn't have any case at all against your husband. But uh, the way things are now, I got to hold him, ma'am. I'm sorry about it. Well, it's like I said, Marshal. You got to do your duty. Yes, ma'am. If uh, there's anything I can do for you, Miss Baxton. Thank you, Marshal, but I'm all right. Can I see Sam before I start back? Uh, of course, ma'am. He's right through that door. I can't stay long. Uh, Chester, hmm? you've been up on Ginger Creek since I have. Yes, sir. Isn't there another nester there not far from Jim Fowler's cabin? A couple of miles beyond, there's one. I don't know his name, though. No, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, Chester, go get our horses, huh? And bring a horse for Sam Baxton, too. He's going to go up there with us. I don't know what you're up to, Marshal, but I'd rather be in jail than spending the night in this place. It's a nice little cabin he's got here, Baxton. Yeah, you improved it some when you sent him into Dodge for the night. It's almost daylight, Mr. Dillon. Okay, Chester. Well, I'm going to build a fire now and let whoever's waiting outside think his victims just got up. What makes you think he'll be there this morning, Marshal? But if he isn't, we'll stay here till he does come. If Mr. Dillon, you want me to pull the door open when you're ready? I'll tell you when, Chester. And after he gets off a couple of blasts with that shotgun, we'll go out and try to take him alive. All right, Baxton, you get over there with Chester. Mm. And I'll try to get this thing started. All we're going to need is a little smoke going up through the chimney. Maybe we can come back when it's all over and cook a little breakfast, Mr. Dillon. Now, we'll worry about breakfast later, Chester. Yes, sir. He's got my gun, Mr. Dillon. You're standing in my way, Chester. Move! Oh, he got outside. Come on. Drop that gun, Baxton. I got him, Marshal. I hit him both times. Drop it, I said. All right. I was only helping out, Marshal. Look, he, he's laying right out there. Gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. I never thought he'd try nothing like that. Walk ahead of me, Baxter. Oh, sure. Oh, Marshal. Look, it's my wife. Yeah. She's dead. I, I, I didn't know who it was, Marshal. I, I, I couldn't see who it was. How'd I know she was doing this? Going around killing people. Your wife shot Jim Fowler yesterday morning. Didn't know she hated Nestor's that much. Well, it's kind of hard to believe, Marshal. 
Yeah. But I guess you never know about a woman. Well, I can tell you about her, Baxton. Fowler's the only man she killed, and she didn't kill Fowler because she hated him. She did it because she loved you. What are you talking about? She was trying to cover up for you. Oh, wait a minute. She almost did it, too. She almost kept you from hanging. Until she claimed one of your cowhands saw Fowler's body when I knew he'd already been buried. I had all the evidence I needed on her right then, Baxton. And the biggest mistake you made was killing her. I didn't know it was her. You knew. But what you forgot was that she'd have confessed to killing Long and Hoffer. Why would she? Because she loved you. Besides, she couldn't have been punished anymore for killing three men than for killing one. You got it all figured out, ain't you, Marshal? Yeah. Yeah, everything. Everything except how she could love a man like you. But then it's like you say. You never know about a woman. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Helen Clee, Paul Savage, and Clayton Post. Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Roy Rowan speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Gene Autry stops a lynching of an innocent man and tracks down the real killer on tomorrow's Gene Autry show. There's time out for Melody on Melody Ranch, too, as Gene sings Down Yonder, Blue Canadian Rockies, and other Western hits. CBS Radio presents the adventure and melody of the Gene Autry show every Sunday on most of these same stations. Be listening tomorrow. Meet William Demarest and Hope Emerson as the Cobbs. Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. One way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Whoever's living in that cabin up ahead, if there's any water around here, Chester. Most likely there ain't. 
These settlers put up a cabin just anywhere and then start praying for rain. Oh, we could have camped back on Smoky Hill River. No, sir. I'd rather go dry. Just as long as we make Dodge by tomorrow night. <laughs> we'll make it. I never seen such a place as that Fort Wallace, Mr. Dillon. Man could go plumb out of his mind living there. Well, they don't build army posts for pleasure loving people like you, Chester. I've been in the army. No? Uh, like it? Well, sir, we didn't always see eye to eye, me in the army, but at least I didn't get killed. <laughs> well, that helps. Hey, I'll bet you look pretty bold in a uniform, Chester. Oh, my, yes. I surely did. <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody home here. Hello? Place looks deserted, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Uh, here, hold my horse, Chester. I'll take a look. There's a man in here, Chester, lying on the floor. What? He's dead. Somebody killed him. We'll put the fire out now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, we better get started. Looks like rain this morning. Yeah, it's too early to tell for sure. Too bad we don't know that fellow's name, Mr. Dillon. Sure do hate to bury a man and not even put a marker on his grave. Well, I'd rather know the name of the man that killed him. Yeah. It's awful easy to get by with killing a man way out here. Yeah, too easy. Say, hey, look over there, Mr. Dillon. Yonder comes a couple of riders. Yeah, I see them. What do you suppose they're carrying rifles for? Stand over there, Chester, about ten feet from me, huh? Yes, sir. And keep the hair out of your eyes. Yes, sir, I will. What are you men doing here? Do you own this place? I wouldn't live in a shack like that. We got a real house over on Turkey Bend. But that don't answer my question, mister. What are you doing here? We found a dead man in the cabin there last night. So we stopped to bury him. A dead man? That must have been Riley. What happened to him? He got shot. Who'd have shot a nice fellow like Bob Riley? Maybe they done it, Deaver. They probably did. You think we ought to hang him? It'd be easier to shoot him and leave him here as a kind of a warning. Yeah. Good idea, Giles. You move that rifle one inch, mister, and you'll die for it. Now, go ahead, mister. You're calling it. It ain't worth a chance. All right, mister, whoever you are, you and your friend get mounted and right out of here. You're Giles, huh? And Deaver? That's right. We don't want people around here. Might get an idea to settle down. Now, you two start riding, and right now. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? That coffee you made this morning was weak as well water. Get that fire going again and do some more, huh? Okay, sir. Sure got a lot of nerve, mister. He don't even blink, Deaver. Look at him. We'll be by here later, mister. We won't ride up so close next time. You better be nowheres around. Come on, Charlie. I almost stopped breathing, Mr. Dillon. It was two against two, Chester. We'd have made out all right. Yes, I know, but it's the waiting that chills me. Say, you know something? I'll bet anything it was them that killed the fellow that lived here. Maybe. But I'd sure like to know more about those two. But right now, we better get started for Dodge. Yes, sir. I'll go get the horses. Chester and I got mounted and rode maybe a mile and a half when... We came across a sort of a camp. 
There was a man there, a tall man with long yellow hair and bright blue eyes that seemed always to be looking into the distance. He had a mule and an old wagon and some hogs that he kept in a well-built, partly covered pen. But he hadn't put up a shelter of any kind for himself, and it didn't look as though he was about to. We got down and walked over to where he was standing by a small fire. Stay down, man. I got no coffee, but you're welcome to that pot of chicory. There's a spoonful of molasses in it. Well, thank you, but we just stopped to say hello. No need to hurry off, mister. My name's Obi Ridges. Glad to know you, Ridges. I'm Matt Dillon, and this is Chester Proudfoot. How you do? I don't meet many people out here. Are you raising hogs? All my life. Not here, though. Where do you live, Ridges? You, you, you got a house somewhere? Ain't lived in a house since I was nine years old. I like it outside. I need a breeze. Well, you're outside here, all right. And I ain't going to move, no matter what they say. Uh, no matter what who says? Them two fellas up on Turkey Bend. Uh, Giles and Deaver? Them's the ones. Uh, tell me, Richards, there's a cabin about a mile and a half north of here. You know the man that lives there, Riley? He comes by here now and then. Well, we buried him last night. Somebody shot him. Hmm. That's bad. That's real bad. You better tell the law about it if you're going anywhere, mister. I don't hold with murdering a man. Well, I'm a U.S. Marshal, Richards. That a fact. Well, now. Don't you ever get into Dodge? Well, never have, but I'm going today. What, in that wagon? It'll take you a week. No, sir. I'm going horseback. Well, I swear I don't see no horse. Well, right out there, fella. Here he comes now. Now, there's Jim Branch leading him. Jim talked me into going to Dodge with him, but I know I won't like it. I'm just doing it for Jim's sake, kind of coddling him along, making him feel good. Where does this Jim Branch live? He's got a little place over west of here somewhere. Jim's nothing but a cowboy, Marshal. You'll be drifting on one of these days, kind of like me that way. Hello? Got company, Jim. You ready to go, O.B.? I'm all dressed up like a sore thumb, can't you see? <laughs> What'd you do, change your socks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this here's a U.S. Marshal, Jim. I forget his name. Oh, uh, my name's Matt Dillon. I'm glad to know you. I'm just proud of you. Well, how would you do? You heading for Dodge, Marshal? Yeah, we'll ride in with you if you like. Good. It's a big day. I've been talking Obi into going to town for three months. He claims he don't like towns. <laughs> Wait till he sees Dodge. I'm happy right here with my hogs. I don't need no town. Your hogs won't miss you. Well, let's get started. I gotta be back in three days, Jim, like you promised. Them hogs will starve if I ain't. You'll be back. Oh, say. What? The marshal here tells me Riley got shot. No. There's Giles and Deaver done it. Now, wait a minute, Richards. It looks like they did it, but if I could prove it, I'd be taking them in for trial right now. Well, it's too bad you can't, Marshal. They're no good, them fellows. Well, I can wait. They'll make a mistake sooner or later. But we better get going. It's 60 miles to Dodge. Good evening, Kitty. Sit down, Matt. Want a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I, I just had dinner. That reminds me. Fella brought me a dozen quail today. Oh? Huh? I can cook them for dinner tomorrow if you're going to be around. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll be here. They ought to be ripe enough by then. You know, I never saw as many quail as there are this year. Right then yesterday, we put up clouds up. Huh. That Jim Branch seems like a nice fellow, Matt. Obie Ridges, too. Yeah, they are, Kitty. They <laughs> sure make a funny pair. Maybe. But still, they're kind of like brothers. Look at him, over there at the bar. <laughs> Opie's getting spookier every minute he's here. <laughs> Obie likes it outdoors, right out on the ground. I doubt he'll ever come into town again. Jim told me he still hasn't been able to get him to take a meal in a restaurant. He has to bring it outside for him. <laughs> Says he can drink inside, but that's all. <laughs> well, maybe we'd all be better off if we lived that way, Kitty. Not me. I don't want to live like an animal. Uh, don't you? 
Uh, hello, Miss Kitty. Uh, hello, Jim. Marshal, something bad's happened. Uh, what, Jim? Well, this fellow here just rode into town from up north. Well, he come by Obie's camp. Marshal, somebody shot Obie's mule and burned up his wagon and killed all his hogs. That's right, Marshal. Oh, yeah. no. Giles and Beaver again, huh? Well, it's Obie I'm worried about. I never should have made him come to town, Marshal. He'll, he'll, he'll kill them fellas now. I know he will. I'll ride out with you, Jim. Right now. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... This coming Tuesday night on most of these stations, CBS Radio turns John Lund loose on his latest case of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the Woodward Manila matter, Dollar launches a search for a missing man and a missing fortune. And when the chips are all totaled up, the missing man and the missing money, each somewhat depleted, are accounted for. Don't forget, this Tuesday night at the star's address, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I wanted to ride out to Obie Ridger's camp that night, but Obie insisted on staying in Dodge. He even tried to have a good time for Jim's sake. Next day, however, on the ride up, well, he just sat his horse and stared straight ahead and never said a word. We reached his camp after dark, and we could see his mule and his hogs lying there in the moonlight, and the remains of his wagon, charred and ghost-like. Now, there was nothing we could do then, so he lay down on the ground and went to sleep. But that was our worst mistake. As I discovered when Chester woke me next morning, Obi had disappeared and he'd taken his rifle with him. We saddled up and rode for Turkey Bend. How much farther is it, Jim? Just beyond them trees, Chester. I told you Obi was going to kill these fellows, Marshal. Well, maybe they're not here. Well, if they're not, he'll find them. Well, let's pull up. I don't see no cabbage. It's right in there. There. There it is. See? see? Oh. Sure. Wait a minute. Look over there. Behind that log. It's Obi. Hey, Obi! So we better walk over. Okay. Hey, what are you doing, Obi? Yeah, you'll get shot. <laughs> Come on, Rudd. Let's run for it. All right. Beaver in there. I got him trapped. Look, Obi, I'll handle this. You can't kill these men. I done killed Giles already. That's him laying right by the door over there. Oh, Obi, you did. Blew the top of his head off. Obi, I gotta put you under arrest. Now, give me your rifle. Wait till I kill Beaver. I can't hang twice. Give me that rifle, Obi. Now. You mean it, don't you? I do. All right, I won't fight you. Here. But I'd sure like to kill Deaver. Chester, hmm? take this rifle and keep an eye on him. I'm going after Deaver. Yes, sir. He'll kill you, Marshal. No. He'll be too curious at first. I'll walk over there with my hands up. But you wait here till I yell. Deaver! Don't shoot. I want to talk to you. That's far enough. Come outside. Obi's under guard. He won't shoot. I'm a U.S. Marshal, Deaver. You're the feller we run into the other day up at Riley's cabin? I am. Now come on out. I thought there was something about you. I got Obi under arrest, Deaver. He admits killing Giles here. He killed him. Did 
Jew and Giles slaughter his mule and his hogs? There's no reason to murder a man. No? No, it isn't. But tell me about you. Did you murder Riley? Well, wait a minute, Mark. You're going back to Dodge with us, Stephen. Oh, no, not me. Keep your hand away from that gun. Let's see how good you really are, Marshal. No! Good for you, Marshal. Good. You killed him. Now they're both dead. Yeah, they're both dead. But you murdered one of them, Moby. Jail. I can't go to jail, Marshal. I'd go crazy. I'd go crazy in jail, don't you understand? I can't go to jail. It was a hard thing to do, but I had no choice. And I took Obi back to Dodge and locked him up. A few weeks later, he went on trial. And after long deliberation, the judge sent us into life imprisonment. Obi stood up and said he'd rather be hung. And I took him back to jail. And I sat there with him for a while. I... I thank you for everything you said, Marshal. You didn't have to do that. Well, I just tried to get the judge to believe you went crazy and you didn't know what you were doing, Obi. I knew what I was doing. I told him I did. Yeah, I know. Why wouldn't he let him hang me, Marshal? And he did what he thought was just, Obi. He didn't think you deserved hanging. I don't know how I stood it this long in jail. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Obi. I, I wish I could help you. They got windows in the penitentiary, Marshal? Sure. Sure, sure they have. Well, I, I, I'll i be around later, Obi. That's pretty hard on him, Chester. Where's Jim Branch, anyway? Oh, my, I ain't seen him since the trial was over. Well, maybe he'll come around later. Uh, I'm going to supper with Doc, Chester. We'll be at Delmonico's. All right, sir. That could go crazy. Locked up, man. Oh, it's happened before. There's nothing I can do about it, Doc. Well, I know. I didn't mean it that way, Mac. Uh, pass me the beans, will you? These are peas, Matt, but you're welcome to All them. right, peas. Peas, then. Thank you. Uh, well, why don't you take a vacation, Matt? You know, go back east somewhere, oh, kind of like St. Louis or Kansas City or someplace like that. Maybe I don't like towns either. Well, that's just what I mean. You, you need a vacation, all right. Oh. Yeah. Well, if I were a rich croaker, maybe I could take one. A rich croaker? Croaker, oh, man. Oh, croaker, man, how could you say... Oh, oh, all right, man, Doc. Would you go take it easy, well, Doc. I... You'll bust yeah. something. It's a fine thing when a mere policeman can insult the noblest profession known to man. I was insulting you, Doc, not the profession. Oh, croaker. Oh, I might have known what it'd be like having supper with you tonight. I'll buy you a drink after, huh? How's that? Well, I don't know. Well, I'll think about Mr. it. Dylan. Now, what's the matter, Chester? Obi Ridgers, he's dead. What? I heard a shot out back, and I run into his cell, and he was laying there dead. There's a gun on the floor. I, I don't know where he got hold of it. You better come look. Uh, he's dead all right, man. You think he killed himself, Doc? Well, the gun was held right close to his head. Maybe somebody called him over to the window and shot him. Maybe. 
But he could have done it himself. The bullet ended right here, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying it could be either murder or suicide, huh? That's right. Well, why would anybody murder him, Mr. Dillon? It don't make sense. Well, it could be somebody who understood how Obi felt about being cooped up the rest of his life, Chester. And somebody who liked him. A good friend. You mean Jim Branch? I don't know who used that gun, but Obi's dead. And I'm going to find Jim. <laughs> Jim Branch wouldn't talk one way or the other. So I charged him with both murder and abetting a suicide, and he was brought to trial. The trial didn't last long due to lack of evidence, and Jim was free. He left the country soon after, and I never heard of him again. And as Kitty had said, he and Obi were kind of like brothers. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Crucian, and John Daner. Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty, Roy Rowan speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, Fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. From all corners of the globe comes the news. Edited and reported for your listening pleasure on CBS Newsroom Sunday Desk. Every Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS radio stations. Three top reporters bring you the latest up-to-the-minute news in their specialized fields. Dick Joy tells you about news at home and overseas... Tom Harmon handles sports, and George Fisher reports the movie land news. That's CBS Newsroom Sunday Desk, tomorrow at the Star's Address. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh tomorrow on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. 
Dillon? He's just plain vanished. And there's no note anywhere, Chester? No, sir, nothing. I looked again all over. Well, it's two days now. That isn't like Doc. And I still think he's just gone off on an emergency out in the country somewhere. Well, maybe, but he's always left word before. Well, what'll we do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Might start asking people, Chester. Uh, try the saloons and the store and uh, maybe the depot. Huh? All right, sir. I'll go right now. Well, I do declare. What? Riding right up Front Street is as big as life. What? <laughs> Why, that old devil. Well, you sure are a sight for sore eyes, Doc. Where in the world have you been, anyway? Hello, Chester. Matt? Well, you had us worried, Doc. Oh, that's so? Well, you've been gone two days. I know. Next time, leave word, Doc. I will. I surely will. If I can. Well, it sure would save us a lot of Wait a minute. What around. do you mean, Doc, if you can? Just that. If they let me, uh, I'll leave word. Come on inside, huh? Okay, Doc, I'm curious. You want to tell me about it? Well, I can tell you part of it, the least important part. I made a promise about the rest. You know how it is, man. No, but you tell me. Well, the other night, Wednesday it was, I was peacefully asleep on my couch when a couple of riders prompt right into my office. They said a man was hurt bad on a place out past Fort Dodge. So naturally I got up and went along with them. Well, then why didn't you leave a note and say so? They told me not to. They told you what? Let him talk, Chester. Of course, I figured then it must be a shooting. But my job is to take care of everybody, sinner and saved alike. And so when we finally got to this place the next day... What place? That's part of what I promised not to tell you. Oh, my. But like I was saying, there was a young man there who'd got himself shot in the back. The bullet lodged right in his spine. I dug it out and did all I could for him. And then I just sat there for quite a spell. And then I put my things away and I... I walked out into the other room. Well, Doc, how is it? I did what I could. What do you mean? He's dead. The shock of extracting that bullet was too much for him. It's a bad place, the spine. You killed him, huh, Doc? No. No, I didn't kill him. He's dead, ain't he? That boy wouldn't have lived more than a couple of days anyway with that bullet where it was. Whoever put it there murdered him. Want me to shut him up? Not yet. Doc, tell me something. You know that boy in there? I do. Mm Mm-hmm. The three of us here, you know any of us? Him? I've seen him around somewhere. It's Dodge, I guess. Well, that settles it. He ain't walking out of here. Shut up. You know his name, Doc? No, I don't. Might come to me, though. Let me think. You don't understand, Doc. He wants to kill you already, and now you're trying to remember his name. That's just going to make it worse. You can't kill a doctor for following his oath. No. Shot that boy and he tried to get away and shoot you just as easy. Don't be a fool. I'm a doctor. And since there's nothing more I can do here, I've got to be available to other patients. Don't you know I'm the only doctor within a hundred miles of Dodge? Right now, it's one too many. Now, wait a minute. I'm kind of thinking the doc's right. You know, he ain't like an ordinary man. A doctor's, well, it's almost like he ain't quite human somehow. He's human enough to tell what he knows that hard head marshal they got in Dodge. The way I figured, it's us or the doc. I'm not interested in what you figure, mister. Right this minute, there may be some woman having a baby and needing me real bad. There may be several folks needing help. He's right. We can't kill him. Well, I can't. You but... do what I say and nothing else, you hear? And, Doc, listen to me. If I let you go, will you promise not to tell her about anybody you recognized here? And if I don't? And doctor or no doctor, I'll kill you myself. Yes, I suppose you would. All right, I'm here as a doctor. And nothing else. I promise. Word of honor, Doc. My word of honor. Okay, get out. That's quite a story, Doc. Oh, you played it right smart if you ask me who were the Doc. Well, I only recognize one of them, Chester, besides the man they'd shot. Have you thought of his name yet? 
Chester, don't you understand? I gave my word I wouldn't tell. Oh, but that was just so you could get away. Yes, but still I gave my word. It doesn't matter how or why. But, Doc, they're just a bunch of killers. I know. Leave him alone, Chester. But I don't... Yes, sir? Matt? Yeah. Wouldn't you do the same if you were in my booth? That would be a hard choice, Doc, but... Uh... Uh, yeah, I suppose I would. Uh, I think any man would. At least, why is any man an honor? I guess I wasn't really thinking about it that way. Well, I'm going to get myself some sleep. Matt, that was a good boy they murdered. I, I hope they hang for it. That blossom. And... How are we ever going to find him, Mister John? I don't know, Chester. We don't even know who they killed. And just think, Doc could lead us straight to him right now. It doesn't make him the Doc happy, Chester. No, sir, it sure isn't. Sincerely, Matt Dillon, you... Marshal... Uh, Jake Worth. Why, you haven't come to Dodge in six months that I know of. I'm here now, Marshal. Oh? The trouble, Jake? I'd call it that. Well? You know that cottonwood? Big one down at Brandy Bend? Yeah. There's a hole down by the roots at the north side of it, Marshal. I put a sack in that hole this morning. It's got $20,000 in it. Twenty thousand. Well, that's a lot of money, Jake, even for you. It isn't if Hank gets back all right. Hank? Well, that's your youngest boy, isn't it? Eighteen last month. He didn't show up the other night, Marshal, and next morning I found a note tacked on the crowd. Said to leave the money or they'd kill him. Well, come on, Jake. We'll try to get there before they pick up the money. Oh, no, Marshal, I won't take any chances. They'd shoot him sure if we did that. You should have told me before you left the money. You should have come here first. You didn't hear what I said, Marshal. I won't take the chance. All I want now is for you to watch for anybody who turns up rich around here. Jake, listen to me. You listen to me, Marshal. Nobody's going to do a thing till Hank's back safe on the ranch. Not one dang thing. Jake, if they killed Hank, you'd want him hung, wouldn't you? I'll hang him myself if it comes to that. All right, then let's go. Let's get down to Brandy Ben and wait for him. No, I already told you no. Jake! I think Hank's dead. You what? I, I think they've already shot him, and he's dead. What are you talking about? Where is he? I don't know. How come you think he's dead? Well, I... I, I can't tell you. Marshal, I've had about enough of this. Look, we're wasting time here. Come on, Jake, I'll tell you what I can on the way to the river. You better, by heaven, or one of us ain't never gonna get to the river. Jake Worth was known as a hard, hot-tempered man, but he was straight as they come. He'd made one fortune in Texas cattle and another in buffalo hides, and now all he wanted was his ranch and his three sons to work it with him. The Worths were good men. They didn't cause any trouble, and they worked hard. It wasn't easy to tell Jake, but without mentioning Doc, I said what I could. And when we reached the Arkansas, we hid our horses in a clump of bushes and Worked our way on foot up to the big cottonwood. And then we saw it. That's him. That's Hank. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Jake. <laughs> they killed him. They killed him all right. He was a good boy. Had his whole life to live yet. Why'd they do it? I gave him the money. Why'd they do it? I, I'm sorry, Jake. Marshal, I want the truth now. Every bit of it. Well, that's all I know, Jake. Hank tried to break and one of them shot him. 
but we'll get them. I'll take care of myself as soon as you tell me who they are. I don't know who don't they are. Don't lie to me, Marshal. You know a lot you're not telling me. I've told you all I can. That's Jake. my boy lying there, Marshal. He's been murdered, and if I didn't know you so well, I'd begin to think maybe you had something to do with it yourself. Easy now, Jim. Then why don't you tell because me? Because the man who told me about it had to promise not to name anybody. That's why. What man? Who is he? I'll get it out of him if I have to cut it out. I know. That's why I can't tell you who he is. What kind of a lawman are you, anyway? I've told you all I can, Jake. No. No, you haven't. Marshal, I don't believe your story about nobody promising nothing. You know who done it. You're going to tell me. I'm giving you 24 hours to name those men. And me and my boys are coming to Dodge. There'll be blood spilt, Marshal. Jake, I give you my word, I don't know who did it. I don't believe you. I'll help you take your boy home now. Go on back to Dodge. I'll manage here. You're making a bad mistake, Jake. 24 hours, Marshal. I'll be there. We'll find you wherever you'll be. Jake, I... So long, Jake. Ladies and gentlemen... At the conclusion of tonight's show, our star, William Conrad, steps out of the character of Matt Dillon to bring you an announcement which we are certain will be of great interest to all our listeners. So be sure to listen at the close of tonight's program for a special message from William Conrad. And now the second act of Gunsmoke. There was no use arguing with him. The man's grief had destroyed his reason. And the worst of it was, I knew his sons would do whatever Jake told him to do. Unless I could stop it somehow, I'd have to shoot it out with three good and perfectly innocent men. And for no reason at all. I thought about it all the way back to Dodge. And by the time I got there, I had an idea. I went up to Doc's and I talked it over with him. All right, Matt. I'll do whatever I can. Well, it might not work, Doc. And you'll be exposing yourself to a lot of danger. Have you thought about that? I have. And I've also been thinking about the men who killed Hank Worth. Well, we could wait till they start spending their money, or it'll one of them gets drunk and maybe talks too much somewhere. Yes, we could, but... Meantime, you and the Worths will have a gunfight. Oh, and that'd be a terrible thing to let happen. All right, then, Doc, let's go. I want to get to the ranch before dark. You know, Matt, I haven't been out here since Mrs. Worth died. Must be four or five years now. Place sure has changed. Yeah. I don't see anybody around, do you? Well, maybe they saw us first. Maybe they hid out. Yeah, maybe. That's far enough, Marshal. Watch him, boys. If he makes a move, shoot. Yes, Jake. Jake, I came here to stop a shooting, not to start one. You can stop it, Marshal. Just tell me who killed my son. If I knew, I'd be on his trail, Jake. What's Doc doing here, anyway? Tell him, Doc. I took the bullet out of Hank just before he died. What? That's right, Jake. Now come down here where we can talk like friends, and I'll explain it. Stay where you are, boys. All right, Doc, let's hear it. Well, they got me out of bed, Jake, and they led me out into the country. Hank had been shot in the back, and I extracted the bullet. But it was no use. He'd have died anyway. 
There were three men there, and I recognized one of them. Who was he? I had to promise I wouldn't tell Jake, or, or they'd have killed me. That well, don't matter now. Think about it, Jake. Doc gave him his word, and you're asking him to break it. Now think about it for a minute. I'm thinking, and I'm thinking about my boy, too. Hank's dead, Jake. We can't help him. Shot in the back, and the coward who did it's running free. You want to help get him, Jake? Don't ask fool questions, Marshal. Of course I want to get him. All right, then listen to me. Those men told Doc if he talked, they'd kill him. Yes, and they meant it, too. All right, so I got an idea, Jake. We'll spread it around that Doc has identified the killer. The news will reach him soon enough. In the meantime, I'll lay low and have Chester tell everybody I've ridden out after them. Go on. Then we'll just wait. One or two or maybe all three of them will come into Dodge to kill Doc some night soon. I still might get away. I'll deputize you and your boys right now and you can wait for them with us. But you're going to have to stay hidden like me. Well, we won't mind that. Not if we get a chance with them, we won't. Good. Funny thing, though. What? man like Doc here... Rather than break his word, he'll make himself a target for those killers? Yeah. Look, Jake, Doc and I are going to go back to Dodge now. I'll see that the story gets started. And in a day or two, you and your boys can ride in. But separately, though. Otherwise, it might cause talk. I understand. And come straight to Doc's. We'll get there. For the next few days, Doc never left his office... I figured that'd make him look scared and draw the killers right into his place. The rest of us sat around in his back room and waited. Chester kept us supplied with food and coffee. And on the sixth night, about midnight, we got our game. Mr. Dillon, I think it's him. What? I just rode up Front Street, three of them. They're tying up outside right now. They acted too deliberate like for ordinary riders, so I run up the back way to tell you. Good. Doc, come on in here, huh? What do you want me to do, Max? Take cover in here and stay out of sight, huh? Whatever you say, Max. Let's go downstairs and meet them, Marshal. No, we might just scatter them that way, Jake. Mm. Now listen, one of them will probably stand guard on the street while the other two come up here to get Doc. Chester, mm. you and the two boys go down the back way. Jake and I'll wait in Doc's office. Now don't jump that man until we go into action up here, you understand? Yes, right, got it. All right, then move and move fast. All right, come on, Jake. Now what? Well, we'll just wait here in the dark. Good. I'm going to bunch up Doc's blanket on the couch here so that they'll think he's in it. What? They're on the stairs now. All right, get back in the corner, Jake, or we'll be shooting each other. Yeah. Now, quiet. And don't start shooting till I do. Wake up, you lying dog. Just shoot him and get out of here. Wait, he ain't here. What? Get your hands up here under a trap. You all right, Jake? Yeah, I got one of them. I'm all right. Doc. Doc, come on out. They're dead. Light the lamp, will you, yeah. Doc? All right. You okay, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, come on in, Chester. So we got him. He tried to get away when he heard the shooting up here, but he ran smack into one of the Worth boys. He's dead. Uh, bring the lamp over here, Doc. No, I don't know either one of these men. Now, Doc, you can tell us now. Is one of these the man you recognized? This one here. I remembered later I treated him for a broken nose some time back. I never did know his name. He came up the trail with a herd, I think. Yeah. Uh, Doc, will uh, you take care of things? Sure, man. Well, Jake. Marshal, um, and me and the boys will be getting back to the ranch now. Sure. Marshal, uh, I... What, Jake? I doubted you. I'm sorry for that. Oh, forget it. No. 
No, it's best I remembered. A man shouldn't make mistakes like that. Well, there was no harm done. The way it worked out. Uh, I'll buy you a drink before we leave, Marshal. I think I'd like that, Jake. Come on, let's go. Now, a special announcement. Here is our star, William Conrad. Thank you, George. You know, I believe this is the first time I've ever set aside the character of Matt Dillon to speak to you. But this is important to all of us here on the show, and I hope it will seem so to you. Starting next week, Gunsmoke will come to you at a new time, on a new day, sponsored by Chesterfield Cigarettes. Chester, Doc, Kitty, and I, together with all of our strong-minded, brawling, hard-living citizens of Dodge, who will come to you next Monday, July the 5th. So from now on, that's when you'll hear Gunsmoke, on Mondays. And we'd like to think that all of our listeners will find time this coming Monday night, July the 5th, to tune in to their local CBS radio station for Gunsmoke. Until then, good night. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again Monday, July 5th, as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. George Walsh speaking. For the top tunes of rural America, here's Saturday Night Country Style every week on the CBS Radio Network. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.